Hello and welcome to another Seven Sports Special. This time, the electrifying 80s. The highs and lows of a dynamic decade of football. Remember fabulous Phil Carmen's altercation with boundary umpire Carberry? And of course the Jacko Show came to town. The Cracker Boys and Peter Bazusto burst on the scene from the west, while the Bears and the Swans settled up north. And of course, there have been some unforgettable finals clashes. It's all a part of the electrifying 80s. It was a summer of discontent at Princess Park when Carlton President George Harris and Premiership coach Alex Jezelenko departed after bitter infighting. But in came popular ruckman Peter Jones as coach and the Blues started the 1980 season defending their 1979 title in deep enemy territory. Almost 30,000 fans squeezed into Victoria Park and they saw the Blues do it again, this time with Wayne Johnston kicking seven goals. Johnston and Carlton simply dominated. Meanwhile, Jezelenko had packed his bags and joined the battling Saints, initially as a player. But after two rounds, St Kilda sacked Mike Patterson and asked Carlton's favourite son to step in. He was 34, but Jezelenko had lost none of that magic. The Saints drew their first game under Jezelenko, but in round four they met Essendon in a game fans still talk about a decade later. And not just because Crackers Keenan got himself a little confused. Fiery Phil Carmen was in hot water over this incident with boundary umpire Graham Carberry. Talking to all, did you see that one? Did you see that one? The net result was a 20-week suspension for the Bombers' star, the biggest sentence handed out in the 1980s. You know, I think now I'll be... Um, I didn't know last night what I'd do. I didn't know whether I'd give it away or not, but I think it's probably making me a little bit more determined to retain my fitness and uh, hopefully play some sort of game towards the end of the year. When did the enormity of the suspension hit you, this morning or last night when you are driving home to Lilydale? Well, I don't know whether it's really hit me yet, you know, I just know that I'm not playing Saturday and it's going to be some time before I do. It was the year of the Tigers and their young goal-kicking champion Michael Roach. In round seven he was on fire against Footscray booting 11 in Richmond's 110-point win. 16 goals. Very, very close. The umpire says yes. Goal to Michael Roach. Goal number 11. The VFL's decision to resurrect the night series during the 1970s had been a winner and it proved an exciting alternative to the day competition. But of all the night games, who will forget the 1980 grand final and North Melbourne's controversial goal after the siren? North's Kerry Good accepted a pass from Malcolm Blythe and the poor old magpies were jinxed again. Good kicks this goal, they've won the match. Oh, what a climax to this 1980 uh, Escort Cup Grand Final. Good's already kicked three goals. He's only about uh, 25 to 30 metres out, dead in front. He kicks this, they've won the game. He's put it through and North Melbourne are three years. North Melbourne have won the match. What a game! I don't think I've ever seen anything like it in my life. John Rantel's career was given the kiss of life in 1980 after being dumped by South Melbourne. And the former Swans and North Melbourne defender broke Kevin Murray's league record of 333 games in round seven. Three games later, Rantel called it a day. The goal of the year featured the acceleration and skill of Geelong wingman Michael Turner. He's well shepherded there by Lund. Runs around another tackle. Turner goes goal, what it's put, it's across the face maybe, it's a, well, it's a beautiful goal from Turner, magnificent football. Meanwhile, Roach was continuing his goal kicking spree with pinpoint accuracy and in round 20, the former Tasmanian booted nine goals against Melbourne to register his century. The Tigers celebrated with a 10 goal win, but the following week they tangled with North and veteran Francis Burke came off second best in this collision. But they breathed them tough in Tigerland, and Burke went to the forward line with blood streaming from a deep cut. He helped Richmond to victory with inspiring play like this. Well, isn't he a marvel, this guy? Got it, I don't know he's going to see the goals. <laughs> Look at the blood just oozing out of these uh, forehead. He is a marvel, this guy, and if he kicks this goal, he'd be an inspiration to the team from about uh, 15 metres out on a slight angle. Let's see what he can do with this. He's had to be shifted away from fullback after getting that knock before he fires, and he's put it through for a To goal. the months of the year, and the league's high flyers were soaring. John Roberts. Oh, up towards their half forward. Father in the mark, brought in by Roberts. Ken Sheldon. Kick down towards Glendinning again. Oh, what a magnificent mark down there to Sheldon. 
Graham Teasdale. Teasdale, the magnificent! Robert Flower. <laughs> Paul Jeffries. <laughs> Daryl Sutton. Beautiful mark there by Sutton. Peter Dacos. Peter Dacos and we're all on a beautiful mark to Dacos. And the best of them, Graham Teasdale again. Teasdale. Oh, look at that one. 1980 also saw the departure of Carl Dittrich after 16 seasons with St Kilda in Melbourne. Big Carl played 285 games, and he was not going to let Kevin Morris forget about his last. There, Morris and Dittrich wrestling. Dittrich pulls Morris's hair. It's on now. Big Carl in the thick of things is playing. Another veteran, Richmond's Kevin Bartlett, talked up one of the many milestones during the 1980s when he set the new record for the most number of games. And Bartlett knew where those goals were. To play on, Bill giving chase a shot by Bartlett. Goes straight for the beautiful goal. Peter Jones and Tony Jewell could not agree on the scores, or something, on qualifying final day. Most, uh, came to blows. Well, that's unusual when the two respective coaches get into loggerheads. But the Tigers and Bartlett just rolled on, with Bartlett booting eight of Richmond's 14 in the second semi-final against Geelong. The Cats went to the preliminary final, but this time Peter Dacos and Ronnie Wearmouth haunted them in a thriller. That's a goal! Collingwood come back. Stewart, Wearmouth, Wearmouth runs in the goal, could be another one for the Magpies, it is! And is he happy? On Brownlow medal night, there were few surprises. Kelvin Templeton had been the outstanding player of the season at centre-half forward for Footscray and became the first key forward to win the coveted prize. The Magpies became the first side to reach the grand final via the elimination final. But their tired legs were no match for the Tigers or that man Bartlett. It was Richmond by a record margin of 81 points, and the experts were predicting the Tigers would be the powerhouse of the 1980s. Well directed one, but it does find Robert Wiley eventually, who fires at the goals. Wait for the goal and play. That's a miraculous kick from Wiley. Jimmy Jess into the goal square. But who would have thought some, like David Cloak, would later change stripes? And for Bartlett, the joy of 1980 was to turn sour as coach of the young, struggling Tigers in the late 1980s. Still, Tiger fans can live in the glory of special moments like this one, when Bartlett left Stan Magro and the Magpies in his wake. Coming around the boundary line, going for goal number seven. That's the result of They lifted Tony Jewell high and went off to celebrate their 10th premiership and the first of a new decade. Nineteen eighty one was a year of change. Even before the season had started, Ron Barassi had returned to Melbourne after sixteen seasons. Kevin Sheedy, Robert Walls, and Malcolm Blight started their coaching careers. David Parkin took the Carlton job, and Alan Jeans replaced Parkin at Hawthorne. It was also the year Carlton dug deep into the vast riches in Western Australia and came up with two overnight stars. A fiery but flamboyant customer called Peter Vazasto and the quietly spoken but highly efficient Ken Hunter. With teamwork like this, they combine to leave their mark on the opening round and reigning Premier's Richmond. So fires the hand pass to Wells. Wells running into goal. He'll have a shot and he's done it again. Lee Matthews spoiled Barassi's homecoming in round one, helping himself to 11 goals at the MCG. It's a goal. 11 goals for Lee Matthews. Jeff Fearing was not the biggest name in football, but he produced the biggest and straightest kick of the decade in round three against Collingwood. No kick from Fearing to full forward. Goal! What a goal! But at Carlton, everyone was in raptures about Bozzasto and his aerial feats. Screws it back towards the half forward position. Bozzasto number two! Everyone, that is, except Jack Dyer, who thought Bozzasto was a good, ordinary player. Well, Bazusta kicked eight goals in this game against South Melbourne, so we'll let you decide. Sensational. Not bad for a very ordinary player. I hope Jack Dyer watches. The Doug Cox affair was the first of several major clearance wrangles of the 80s, resulting in the bitter dispute between St Kilda and Richmond. But the Saints and Cox took up the challenge, and despite the loss of premiership points hanging over their head, Cox led St Kilda out in round nine against the Tigers before he made an early exit with concussion. 
Collingwood went to the top of the ladder in round 10 thanks to a young magician by the name of Peter Dacos. This was one of his nine goals for the afternoon. Let's put it through for another goal for the Magpie. They were celebrating down at Cadinia Park following the long-awaited arrival of East Fremantle champion Brian Peake, who packed his Sandover medal and his bags to join the Cats in June. Peake arrived in Geelong by helicopter, pulled on his new jumper and made his presence felt immediately. He was part of the Cats side which destroyed North Melbourne by 114 points. Poor old North could not take a trick. Just ask Malcolm Blight, who lost his bearings a week later at the MCG. I think he might have put that through for a point. He's run the wrong way. It's unbelievable. He thought that was the goals. He really still thinks it now. Look, it is unbelievable because I was done better myself. The forerunner to the VFL's expanded competition was the decision to play interstate matches in Brisbane and Sydney in 1981. The Hawks and the Bombers slugged it out under the Gabba Sun. And some, like Hawthorne's Robert Dippy and Domenico, got more than they bargained for. Simon Madden, oh, oh, there's players. one down. And he's reported, I would say. Ronnie Andrews dropped him like a sack of spuds. He's and got him, uh, all right. he's got him. You're gone this time, Ronnie boy. In the middle of 1981, you might recall, our cricketers were having a torrid time in England at the hands of one Ian Botham. Well, back home, North fans were hailing Malcolm Blight as their Ian Botham after his decision to stand down as playing coach in round 16. The following week, with Barry Cable at the helm, Blight stepped out and let fly with 11 goals against Footscray. He's kicked six. Here's number seven. No mistake about. Meanwhile, Essendon was getting its act together under Kevin Sheedy. And in the night grand final of 1981, they found some inspiration from Tim Watson just when they needed it most. And did those Essendon fans love it? And he's put it through! Well, what an opportune comment. Listen to the crowd. Listen to that crowd. The Bombers lost five of their first six games. But when they met Carlton at Princess Park in round 20, they were aiming for their 14th straight win. The Blues and Jim Buckley were in great touch. But when Carlton skipper Mike Fitzpatrick tried to slow things down, they paid the penalty. Under a crowd, and he's probably been the best man on the ground. He's taking it off into wasting time. Well, can do that, yes. Essendon turned to young champion Neil Danaher for some last-minute heroics, and the Bombers got up by a point. But all good things must come to an end. And in the final round of the season, the Bombers were relegated to the elimination final when the determined Cats, fired by Terry Bright, grabbed the double chance. Bright kicks his second, hangs Geelong to 6 13, 49, Essendon 6 10, 46. 1981 produced possibly the zaniest man we have seen on the football field. Melbourne full forward, Mark Jackson. To everyone, he was simply Jacko. And as Hawthorne fullback Kelvin Moore discovered in round 22, there is only one Jacko. Now, just what was that message Jacko was trying to pass on to Kelvin? <laughs> Goodness. Oh, dear. He is a one-man show down there. He's as happy as Larry. Kicked his first goal, and he is told about 15,000 people in no uncertain manner. <laughs> The marks of the year. Michael Roach. Peter McConville. Peter Bazasto. Kick Bazasto flies. Oh, how was that? What a mark by Bazasto. Simon Madden. Simon Madden. What a magnificent mark. McConville again. Oh, McConville exactly. And Michael Roach. Could be eight straight rows. Look at that goal. Ricky Barham. At the back of the bar, at the back of the bar. And that man, Bazasto. Sailing forwards into all oh, that Bazasto, mark of the year. Yes, it was the mark of the year. But Bazasto took the double with this piece of play for goal of the year. Has a step shot at goal and has put it through. What an amazing goal. The final started with Essendon hot favourites against Fitzroy in the elimination final. But the Lions, led by courageous Gary Wilson, had other ideas, winning by 15 points. With Carlton through to the grand final, it was down to Collingwood and Geelong on preliminary final day. But the Magpies and Rene Kink were determined to put Geelong down for the count. Superbly. Hit him with the, uh, the shot. 
Somehow, the Cats had left Gary Sidebottom behind in Geelong. But they couldn't catch anything that day, the bus or Peter Dacos. And the Magpies were into their third successive grand final. Collingwood hit the lead. Four goals to Dacos. Part of the big build-up to the grand final included the first tie in the Brownlow medal since 1905. Fitzroy's Bernie Quinlan and South Melbourne's Barry Round took friendship all the way, each winning a medal after the league decided to scrap the countback system. Once again, the VFL could not have asked for a better draw card. Carlton versus Collingwood in the grand final. The Magpies were desperate to break their premiership jinx, and for a while it appeared as though Ricky Barham and Dacos would end the drought. But the Blues hit back, and as Wayne Johnson found, everything was bouncing their way. And if Wayne Harms had haunted Collingwood in 1979, he was back to do it again in 1981 with brilliant football like this. Shot for goal. This will be a long one. It's a beautiful goal by Wayne Harms. Great goal. Beautiful kick. Oh, what a great mark to Harms. Mark of the day by a mile. Harms sparked his teammates into action. First, it was Jim Buckley. A handball. Buckley lines them up. Steadies on its way. Then Ken Sheldon. Points the difference. As a go now for Sheldon, a hurried shot for goal. He's put it through. Four points the difference now. Sheldon's second goal. Before Rod Ashman said goodnight to the Magpies and season 1981. Carlton hit the front in the final turn. There's a feeling in the city. They're talking in the town. Today we're making history, and we won't let you down. We're Swans and we are Sydney. We'll set the town alight. Get ready for the liftoff. This bird is taking flight. And so it was welcome to football Sydney style. They started life in 1874 as South Melbourne. But 106 years later, they were shipped from the Lake Oval to the Harbour City and Australia's rugby stronghold. It was the end of an era for South, and there was much bitterness and controversy over the move. But it signalled the start of a new team, the Sydney Swans. Their first match was against Melbourne, and here's one for the trivia buffs. Who kicked the Swans' first goal in Sydney? The goal umpire might not have had it quite right, but Colin Hounsell was claiming full points as the Swans went on to the first of many wins in Sydney. Melbourne, one behind, one point in the first quarter. Back in Victoria, North Melbourne unveiled the much-heralded Cracker Brothers with stunning results. Jimmy made his mark on the game in the first 10 seconds against Richmond. McCann couldn't complete the mark. And brother Phil was no slouch either, particularly when it came to finding Jimmy. Oh, it's good. When co-tenants Hawthorne and Carlton clashed at Princess Park in round four, there were no big pardons, as Ken Hunter discovered. But the Blues picked themselves off the ground, and with Rod Ashman running riot, they booted ten goals in the third quarter to win by 61 points and take a place in the five. Ashman was inspirational and was the start of a Carlton resurgence, which continued well into the season. Out the back to Ashman. Could be another goal for Ashman. It was the Swans' turn in round nine, and the Sydney Siders were powerless to stop a 12-goal onslaught from Carlton in the opening term. Swans coach Ricky Quaid. Well, look, I tell you what, Wells should have lost that, but it bounced back for him. It's unbelievable. It's another goal, Pete. 12 for the quarter, kicked by Jimmy Buckley. Even the Swans' fullback Rod Carter was looking for a breather. By now, the Jacko show was gathering momentum and becoming more outrageous by the week. At Windy Hill, this tangle with Essendon's Ronnie Andrews earned Jacko a two-week suspension and set up a return bout in the boxing ring. When Fitzroy Rover Gary Wilson collected Richmond strongman Jim Jess, he proved the old adage, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Both sides dished it out. Brad Gotch collected Wayne Shand and Mick Conlon seemed to lose his way, trying to get past Richmond's Mick Malthouse. In a high-scoring game, the Tigers had Brian Taylor on target with 10 goals. But Tigers fans did not get to see much of Taylor, who was standing in for the injured Michael Roach. 
two full forwards just did not go into one. And Taylor later joined the exodus of players from Punt Road to Collingwood. The Swans have always promised they'd fly a Premiership flag off the Sydney Town Hall. And they came to VFL Park in July, determined to take home the 1982 night grand final against North Melbourne. With play like this from Sylvia Faschini, the cup was theirs. Little wonder their jubilant captain Barry Round had a smile from ear to ear. In round 18 at Windy Hill, Lee Matthews went some way to proving who was the best and toughest player in league football. While Alan Jeans urged his charges on, Matthews took out his frustration on the behind post with stunning results. And broke the point post. Oh, talk about a he-man. How was that? He split it right down in half. <laughs> a fantastic effort by Lee Matthews. But there were few objects that got in Matthews' way that year, as Melbourne's Peter Giles could testify after this incident in round 21. It appeared there were one or two Melbourne players intent on evening the score, but this was well before trial by video had started. See for yourself. A little bit of fireworks here at the MCG. There weren't many players who stood in Mick Conlon's path when he was charging his way to goal. This magnificent show of strength and skill earned the Fitzroy Ford Goal of the Year. And he's just about made the distance. That's a goal. What a brilliant... The Mark of the Year had the usual contenders. Paul Vanderhaar. Trevor Barker. <laughs> Jeff Raines. Rollins, Hunter and Raines! Long Michael kick. Tuck. The goal square. Tuck will be the flyer for Hawthorne. Simon Madden. Get the ball moving. Madden up high! Oh, what a pass. Malcolm Blight. Forward line for North Melbourne. Fly! Beautiful mark to Malcolm Blight. Tuck ruck roving. Gary Bacanara. Pull back. Bacanara! Oh, that's a mark! Field. Puts the ball. Blight. Trying to find Carmen. Oh, Blight! Oh, yeah. And Bacanara again. Bacanara, another great mark. Ken Hunter. Up towards the half four. Well, that's Hunter. But it was Reigns high over David McMahon for the top mark of 1982. The final started on a winning note for Carlton against Hawthorne in the qualifying final. But there was one sour note when Wayne Johnston was outed for two weeks in this incident with David Polkinghorne. So Blight is going for his 100th goal. It was a day for the old and the new at the MCG in the first semi-final. Malcolm Blight was on 99 goals when he lined up on the quarter time siren, aiming to become only the second North Melbourne player behind Doug Wade to register three figures. As hard as they thought, Blight going for his hundred. He's kicked it after the siren at quarter time. His shot sailed through, as did five from a hawk and the number 47 Guernsey making his VFL debut, Dermot Brereton. Goes forward. Certainly made his mark this afternoon. The Brownlow medal produced a minor upset. Brian Wilson, who had been rejected by Footscray and North Melbourne, became the first Melbourne player to win football's top individual award since Don Cordner in 1946. <laughs> David Parkin's Blues were aiming for back to back flags when they lined up against Richmond on grand final day. Richmond, under Francis Burke, had defeated Carlton in the second semi final. And although tempers were a little frayed, the Blues settled down and were looking good. Lear into it. Jones has had his number taken. There's another go. Sheldon's into it too with the reins. But I think the time is oh, low. Ken Hunter felt the full force of Jim Jess. And for a while it seemed he didn't know what day of the week it was. And the Tigers are concentrating on using the uh, shoulder rather than going after the ball. And we find the umpire will fall it up. His replacement, Robert Klump, fared a little better. But Hunter was soon back on his feet to cap off this fine mark by Peter Bizzasto. He goes for a hand pass to Hunter. It could be a goal coming up. Yes, it's a goal. So it's a goal of the blue. The Tigers could not take a trick. And the luckless Bruce Tempany came off second best in this collision, resulting in a broken arm. James Carl the kicking in danger, I'd say, as we... He could be right. As you said, he certainly has had a bad run with it. The Blues made the most of Richmond's misfortune. And when Alex Marcou sealed the Tigers' fate in the final term, Carlton had the 1982 Premiership sewn up.
It was football in March as the Blues unfurled their 1982 flag to start one of the most controversial seasons in VFL history. Flag is unfurled. A cheer goes up from the Carlton stand. 1983 VFL season is underway at Princess Park. The rematch of the previous year's grand finalists was another triumph for Carlton. This time, the Blues down Richmond by 10 goals. At the MCG, the game's best-known rivals, Melbourne and Collingwood, were unveiling their high-priced and new-look lineups. Brownlow medalist Peter Moore had swapped jumpers and was now a demon, together with another medal winner, Kelvin Templeton. While Moore was quickly on the scoreboard for Melbourne, it was Collingwood's interstate brigade, guided by new coach John Cale, who led the Magpies to victory with goals like this to first gamer Mike Richardson. As the imports lift and Richardson goals. Essendon travelled to Sydney the following day and a lanky young forward in the number three Guernsey played his first game. Was this the promise of things to come from Paul Salmon? They're in front by a goal, two goals to seven in 45 seconds. Any but the Swans defied all logic when they fought back twice in the dying moments with only 13 fit men to clinch an unlikely victory. It was a behind from the injured Greg Smith which sealed the game. So the Swans lead by that margin. Can they hang in there? Punched away again. Going through his Cruz, out the burner. And were those Swans players happy? The final scores. We see the scores now. 79, 111. The Swans to Western 15, 20, 110. St Kilda sent shockwaves through the competition when it obtained a clearance for former Swans rover Silvio Faschini via the courts on the eve of round four. But no one was quite prepared for the year's bigger sensation. The Saints played ex-Swan Paul Moorwood without a clearance against Geelong. Starting slow there now, so you can go one club one week and another the next week if not on contract, so <laughs> <laughs> make, make some brass out of that one. Hawthorne and Essendon were flexing their muscles near the top of the ladder in round eight with Hawk wingman Robert Dippier-Domenico right in the thick of things. This collision with Essendon's Alan Stoneham led to a half-time dust-up and another tribunal appointment for Dippier-Domenico. Well, I think I nominated this before, about halfway through the first quarter, this could be on. They're still at it now, Dippier-Domenico, and there's a bloke down there. Who's it, Stoneham? Essendon and Stoneham looked a sorry lot at half-time, but after the interval, it appeared the Bombers had some scores to settle, and Lee Matthews seemed to lose his bearings. He's still not the best in the world because he can't stand up too good. And Ronnie Andrews uh, clapping his hands and he's got a grin from ear to ear. North Melbourne scored a 111 point win over Carlton in round 10 with goals like this from Ross Glendinning. What a magnificent goal! Oh, what a ripper! What a beautiful goal! But three weeks later, the ruse went down by a staggering 150 points with some sheer brilliance from Matt Rendell. Carlton and Richmond obviously meant business in the night grand final. Or was Peter Bazasto just staging? Wayne Johnston captained Carlton that night, and with Wayne Harms and Rod Ashman combining well, the Blues added another trophy to their cabinet. Johnston accepted the trophy and gave the football world a big grin, complete with mouth guard. the cheer squad as Kevin Bartlett comes onto the ground for his 400th game of VFL football. And so it was game number 400 and another milestone for Richmond legend Kevin Bartlett when he led the Tigers out against Collingwood in round 19. The first player to reach 400 games. What tribute did Kevin Bartlett have than to see a crowd like that? The Lions were celebrating in round 21 when Bernie Quinlan became the first Fitzroy full forward to boot 100 goals in a season. Quinlan's trademark, the long drop punt, sailed through to give him a century and the Lions' second place on the league ladder. Long, it's there! It's 100! 100 goals to Bernie Quinlan and here they come in their thousands. Essendon showed plenty of cheek in the elimination final when the Bombers took it right up to Carlton with goals like this to Tony Bahagia. points the difference now. I got my back plate. He seems to be pretty handy, that guy. Got a couple of victories this year. 
Bruce Toole's lost his headband now. Cameron Clayton seemed to take a liking to Bruce Toole's headband, even if the Blues didn't. Take his headband off. Yes, Kevin Abbott tried that in the night match uh, here a few years ago and duel with Berserk. Like taking a but Bahaji decided he'd better tidy things up, and away went the headband, straight over the fence. Over the fence, Bahaji. <laughs> Well, they got the Blues by the throat at the moment. Essendon. Essendon marched into the preliminary final and gave North Melbourne a football lesson. Starting with Terry Danaher's goal in the first minute, before Bill Duckworth let one fly from inside the centre square. Duckworth favours the torpedo punt kick, a mammoth kick into the goal square, and it's a goal! Arnold Brydas also appeared to let one fly, as Glenn Hawker discovered. But at the other end of the ground, the Bombers and Tim Watson were having the last laugh. Watson, who steadies, Watson's shot, it's true, and once again, Essendon answer the challenge. The marks were spectacular as always. Wayne Bettison. Peter Bazzasto. Go over the top, Bazzasto. Back to the centre circle. Dermot Brereton. Oh, beautiful mark. Gary Pert. Oh, what a great mark. Watch the Another from Bazzasto. Oh, there's a Bazzasto again. He's already kicked by. Daryl Cunningham. Oh, that is a Daryl Cunningham, was it? Graham Hinchin. Peter Knights. Trying to win this game as the ball goes out. It's a great mark to Peter Knights. Peter Smith. What a fly by Smith. He's come down pretty heavy that time. Bernie Quinlan. Quinlan! And the best and most courageous, Ken Hunter. It was another Brownlow medal for North Melbourne, with Ross Glendinning following in the footsteps of North's previous winners, Keith Gregg and Malcolm Blight. Essendon made it to the grand final for the first time since 1968, and for a while it looked as though luck would favour the Bombers when Hawthorne's Gary Bacanara went down early in the game. Oh, down he goes. He's in all sorts of trouble, Bacchanara. What a blow for Hawthorne. The Hawks teamed magnificently through Rodney Ede and Loveridge before Essendon's hero Tim Watson took a solid knock which seemed to fire up the Bombers as their star lay dazed on the ground behind Clay. There it is behind Clay. And Watson still in the hands of the trainer. Looking in the air or on the ground, Matthews and the Hawks simply could not miss. Skipper. Kick from Wallace, looking for Matthews. Heard, oh, beautiful one hand. They're just not uh, completing it enough. Matthews, a shot at goal. Oh, it's a chip! Lethal done it! Colin Robertson was too elusive for the Bombers, and not only did he help set up Hawthorne's win, he took out the Norm Smith medal. Up to Matthews, he picks it up, yes. And the mark played to the Hawthorne skipper. Finally, the slaughter became too much for Essendon fans, who decided to make an early exit. But the Hawks were not finished, and Loveridge accepted a gift from Simon Madden to add further insult to injury. And there we see Loveridge firing the goals, and I think he's put it through the earth. Yes, the goal. We see the, the final siren rang, an 83-point victory for the Hawks, giving Alan Jeans his second premiership and Hawthorne its fifth. Another season of off-field changes started on a bright note for Carlton and its West Australian full forward, Warren Ralph. With the Blues blitzing North Melbourne by 137 points, they found Ralph was only too willing to finish off the good work from further afield. Runs to an open goal, a hand pass to Ralph for goal number six, and it's right through the centre. At Moorabbin, St Kilda and Essendon fans saw the promise of things to come in the shape of their respective full forwards. Paul Salmon stood out like a beacon in front of goal for Essendon, and 18-year-old Tony Lockett was on his way to stardom for St Kilda with strong play like this. Salmon, almost overnight, became the darling of the Essendon horde, and he could do no wrong. Suddenly, there were comparisons with John Coleman as he marked and kicked everything. Again, one hit by Salmon! What a wonderful mark! On the playing field, there is nothing to rival a Collingwood-Carlton clash. And at VFL Park on Anzac Day, the old rivals turned on a game to remember. The Magpies were on fire early through Bruce Abernathy, and then Mark Williams. 
And this is quick, it's going to be a goal. Here's one. Carlton had the chance to pinch the game on the siren with a controversial free kick to Ralph. It's a free kick, it might go there to uh, to Ralph. Oh. got him on the side of the head, so this could level the scores. It could be a drawn game. What time to give a decision. Oh. And all the players there, look at the Collingwood players in the goal square, trying to put him off. Can he kick this one to make it a draw? Look at all those Collingwood players, he fires. He's got it, I think. He's missed it. And when the Carlton spearhead missed his shot, Magpie supporters believed justice had been done. It was almost the final chapter in the controversial career of St Kilda's Robert Muir against Carlton at Princes Park in round six. This clash with former St Val Perovic earned Muir a 12-week suspension. But the immediate sequel saw umpire Kevin Smith struggling to come to grips with the fiery wingman. Muir apparently thought he was hard done by and took out his frustrations in no uncertain manner. When Michael McLean put Footscray one point down against Collingwood in round 10, the Magpies and defender Graham Allen decided to play safe, a decision which had disastrous consequences. Simon Beasley accepted the pass. Jim Edmund reminded Allen of his costly mistake, and the Bulldogs went on to win by five points. Collingwood may have thrown this one away as Beasley now from directly in front. Puts the goals in front. Four goals to Simon Beasley. While Salmon's goal kicking feats were winning rave reviews, Geelong had unearthed a former Hawthorne player with little fuss or fanfare. But on this day against Richmond, Ablett showed just what a match winner he can be. So to Ablett, he's kicked one, he's kicked another one. Gary Ablett's going to win this game for the Cats. It seemed nothing was going to stop Salmon and the Bombers that year, and everything was going along nicely for the young giant, until a collision with Collingwood's Jeff Raines buckled his knee and ended prematurely what could have been a 100-goal season. Now, Salmon is down at centre field. Salmon down, he hasn't moved from a while, but he's really stunned down there. Oh! Melbourne and Essendon met head-on at VFL Park in round 14, and both sides were on the receiving end before they decided to settle it the old-fashioned way. Square of trouble as he downs uh, I think you called a, a square off, wouldn't you, Lou? There they are all bouncing in now. You just try and sort that one out yourself. The Demons tried safety first, but as fullback Stephen Smith discovered, that didn't work either. No, it's not. It'll be a goal by Eustace. Something must have been upsetting Melbourne coach Ron Barassi. Whatever he was saying did not go down well with defender Shane Zantuck. Zantuck and Barassi are having a go. The players are pushing Zantuck away from him. Oh, Barassi's white down there in the, in the face, but they had a real go, and I'm, I'm not kidding. The players had to push uh, Zantuck away. He's wanting to go back and have a go on him again. Mm, very interesting. Zantuck very upset about it. Bernie Quinlan was a popular man with Fitzroy's faithful after he registered 100 goals for the second successive year, doing it in style against St Kilda at the Junction Oval. And now, the kids around the boundary line, Quinlan lines up. Goal number 100 to Bernie Quinlan. His teammates rush in to celebrate a great moment with him and second season in a row, he's done that in the second season in a row. He's guided Fitzroy into the finals. There were seven major contenders for Mark of the Year. Stephen Ick, Gary Pert, Ken Hunter, Oh, there's a great mark to Hunter. Warwick Kappa. Oh, there's Kappa again. How about that? Oh, what a beauty. Dennis Banks. Great mark by Banks. Michael Reeves. Being in that pack and over the back, a great mark taken by Michael Reeves. But Wayne Carroll took the season's honour with this screamer. What a mark! Peter Moore became only the second man after Ian Stewart to win Brownlow medals at two different clubs. The Melbourne Ruckman polled 24 votes to win by three from David Cloak. 
When Hawthorne and Carlton tangled in the qualifying final, Lee Matthews quickly put the Hawks on the scoreboard and reminded Rod Austin it was going to be the first of many. Six, in fact. It turned into a fiery contest. Firstly with Matthews going down, then Austin. And finally, Brereton. Oh, here's a Josh swap. Two of them flattened. And from the Melbourne Cricket Grounds, we begin the 1984 BFL Grand Final between Hawthorne and Essendon. Hawthorne were aiming for back-to-back -back flags when they met Essendon in the Grand Final. And with Matthews on target, they made a flying start. Only about 30 seconds. Colin Robertson added another, and it appeared that would set the trend for the rest of the day. Hawthorne, he couldn't miss them there, could he? And a great start by Hawthorne. They want to go. But Essendon coach Kevin Sheedy reached into his bag of tricks and reorganised the Bombers' lineup with stunning results in a nine-goal last quarter. It started with Leon Baker, and the goals just kept coming. Towards full forward again. Oh, Bradbury, here's the goal. It's only a few points in it. Oh, those two goals came up in two minutes. Up it goes there. Baker taps the ball on. Oh, beautiful play. Goes for a goal. And I think they've hit the front. Vanderhaar knocked off. There's a going now for Weston. He's put it through for a goal. Got a match winner this guy's been. It's set a half forward. This premiership was Sheedy's premiership with these tremendous moves. On Paul Weston and Tim Watson finally sealed the game for Essendon, giving the Bombers their first flag since 1965. Hawthorne and Essendon had grown to know each other in 1983 and 1984 and it was fitting they started the 1985 season at VFL Park on March 23, a week earlier than the rest of the competition. Hawthorne had lured former All-Australian captain Steve Malaxos from Western Australia, but he turned out to be a disappointment and eventually returned to Perth. One of the most controversial changes of the 1980s was the time-wasting rule. But although it had been used in practice matches, Essendon's Roger Merritt became the first victim when Glenn James reached for the book in this incident. The new rule comes in. Friday night football came to the MCG and Collingwood and North Melbourne fans went to great lengths to get into the Pack Stadium for the round one clash, even tearing the doors down. Those who made it inside saw Collingwood's Brian Taylor in fine form leading the Magpies to victory with seven goals. Gary Ablett had become an overnight star, and with play like this, he took Geelong to an upset win over Hawthorne at VFL Park. North Melbourne built a reputation as one of the most tenacious sides of the 80s, and their record in tight finishes was extraordinary, as Carlton discovered in round three. After Ross Glendinning moved the Kangaroos closer, David Dwyer marked, and with precious seconds ticking away, he quickly goaled to give North a courageous win. I think too far out, I think, Jack. It's a long way out. He's going for it very quickly. Puts the ball to Booty, kicks it off. And over. Oh, he's put it through. He's put it through. David Dwyer kicks that goal. North Melbourne in front. I can't believe it. The following week, Carlton and Geelong took an obvious dislike to each other before the ball was bounced, leading to a series of ugly incidents. David Rhys-Jones went down for the count, and the fights continued at both ends of the ground. In the aftermath, only one player, Geelong's Paul Jeffries, was reported, and he received a three-match suspension. Oh, look at Jack O's up the other end. Oh, he's putting on his own concert. We can't see it. But Jack O at the other end has just gone three rounds of shadow boxing and uh, Jeffries wearing the 22 Guernsey for Geelong is having his head ripped off. Peter Knight started his career against Sergio Silvani, but in his twilight he was pitted against Silvani's son, Stephen. It was a fascinating display of high marking, first from young Silvani, but the Hawthorne veteran showed he'd lost none of his spring. But he's had 19 kicks for the match. Knight, and that's uh, mark number 10 for the Hawthorne veteran. Nor his ability to contact with the ball. 
1985 will be remembered for two black days in football. Collingwood Ruckman John Burke was reported by six umpires and suspended for 10 years following this incident in a reserves match at the Lake Oval against the Sydney Swans. It appeared Burke decided to take his frustration out on the field umpire Phil Waite. He was handed the heftiest penalty by the VFL Tribunal in modern history. Let's have a look at this one on the replay. Well, oh, oh boy. Oh. Did we see right then, right? I thought, <laughs> actually, when I was... Oh, he oh, just oh, whacked oh, the umpire. Oh, hey! Oh, no! That's unbelievable! Oh, boy! Well, that, this is sensational. That, the umpire has gone down. Now, there are a number of others coming up to talk to him. Surely we've got to get the Collingwood runner out here and uh, get him off the ground for a spell. Oh, he whacked oh, he's, he wants to be very careful because... Uh, I'd take him off now, the Well, boy. he's got him. I he's think got you've got to take the boy off. Very smart. Definitely. You've got to take off. the boy off. He's You're leaving just the ground. Take him off. But even bigger news was the report and subsequent court appearance by Lee Matthews in this incident with Geelong's Neville Bruns. The catch rover went down, and it was revealed later he had suffered a broken jaw. For his part, Matthews collected a broken nose. It was a sad blot on the game, and after being charged by the BFL Commission, Matthews had his playing permit cancelled for a month effectively resulting in a three-week suspension and missing the ninth grand final. The Hawthorne skipper was also charged by police and was fined $1,000. Later reduced to a 12-month good behaviour bond on an assault charge. All I'm going to say is, I don't care... This who is a thinks, disgrace. I don't care who, who thinks Jackson can play football. He's virtually started all this. Andrew Buse gained a reputation as one of the toughest and most elusive rovers in the competition. And on this day against Footscray, he slipped and slithered his way to goal of the year. Oh, boy! He hooks it back. Don't tell me he's going to score a goal! Hawthorne went to the night final without Matthews, but the Hawks had enough skill, determination and backup to cover his loss and take the title against Essendon. Get onto his left foot and have a snapshot at goal. That's not bad. He's dropped it, I think. I'm right in the goal on fire. It's true. Michael Tuck stepped in as captain and was more than happy to take the trophy. The final saw Footscray making its first appearance since 1976, but the first semi-final was a memorable day for Beasley, who booted seven goals, including his 100th for the season to take the Bulldogs into the preliminary final. Beasley going for the tuck. Walks in for the kick from about 15 metres out. And there it is, and the crowd go for sir. Now to the marks of 1985. Although the Bulldogs lost to Hawthorne to miss making the grand final, there was some consolation when former West Australian Brad Hardy got up to win the Brownlow medal. First quarter on the seven network of the 1985 BFL grand final between Hawthorne and Essendon. I think we can expect some fireworks early. The Bombers and the Hawks were back again on grand final day, and the experts were right, there were fireworks. This all-in brawl erupted on the outer wing in the first quarter players from both sides let out the tension that generally builds up before a grand final. 
Players fought, wrestled and jostled each other and it took some time before umpires could restore order. When they did, Essendon recovered magnificently and went on to play some brilliant football. Bill Duckworth was obviously delighted with this goal. And Billy's pretty happy about it. While Tim Watson was always on the move. Pack of players down there, it rebounds to Watson. He has a pink. The only shining light for Hawthorne was Dermot Brereton, who played his heart out for the Hawks in booting eight goals. He could get his name in the record books if that's a goal. It is. Good on him. He's broken the record. Eight goals. That's a fantastic effort. It was a tight first half, but the Bombers ran riot after the half-time break. Alan Izzard burned his opponents off their feet. Redhead has a shot at the goals again, he's done it. And Mark Harvey was ever the opportunist, as finally the Bombers went on to win by 78 points. Well, he got it through. It's a goal. That's his fourth. The or over the half forward line for Hawthorne. There's the Cyrus. Sarah to win the uh, game, and uh, Essendon the premiers for 1985, winning two in a row. While the Bombers celebrated, Hawthorne gave Lee Matthews a fitting farewell to his playing career after 340 games. Lee Matthews being carried off the ground, almost in tears, I think. 340 games and receiving a huge round of applause even from the Essendon fans. Carlton and Hawthorne unveiled some of the finest interstate recruits to come to Victoria in the opening round of the 1986 season. Former West Australian John Dorotich combined with ex-South Australian Stephen Kernahan. The tall centre-half forward had an immediate impact on VFL football. But it was a small, shaggy-head rover, looking more like Tiny Tim, who made his presence felt. Hawthorne and Carlton had been locked in a battle to gain John Platten's services. But the Hawks were quickly repaid for the trouble they went to in securing South Australia's number one rover. Downfield the bird, he takes them out into the open goal and the Hawks are on fire. There had been six coaching changes before the start of 1986, but none of the new faces could match the hot gospeling style of Geelong's John Devine. The Cats had lured Devine back from Tasmania to replace Tom Hafey, but when Geelong trailed badly against Fitzroy in round one, it was obvious Devine wanted to get his message home immediately. The seventh coaching change came in round four when Lee Matthews took over from Bob Rose at Collingwood and guided the Magpies to a first up win over Geelong. While it was a memorable start to Matthews' coaching career, the umpires had a day they'd prefer to forget. Pushing the back you could ever hope to see. <laughs> the drop was tackled by Cleve and Collingwood got the free kick. It's unbelievable. Fitzroy's Michael Reeves had plenty to say after this comical mix-up in round six, and he just could not get around Richmond full forward Michael Roach. Gold play on. This is good. Chris Burton accepted the gift for the Tigers before Reeves set off to give umpire Gavin Dorr his version of the incident. Now, just how many drinks was Reeves ordering? Look at look at Reeves run out to the umpire. He's made Carl Lewis look slow. Goals were something special in this night match between Essendon and North Melbourne at the MCG. And for North's elusive Phil Cracker, there were a couple of gems. If Cracker's fourth goal was brilliant, his next was something else, as he spun around Essendon's Frank Donnell to kick the goal of the year. I hear from Donnell, lefty for dead, beautiful play, as there's a running shot of goal, he might have got this one. A goal, what a goal, but he's down too, let's hope he's on our be okay. The Sydney Swans had become football's first privately owned team under flamboyant Sydney medico Dr Geoffrey Edelston. The Swans went on a buying spree and when they came to Victoria Park in round 13, they were in second place while Collingwood was outside the five. Them in front for the first time for the day. There it is on its way. That's got a bad sort of a shot and the Swans have hit the front. Barry Mitchell got the Swans up by a point in a controversial finish, but the fans were obviously upset as they gave the umpires a hostile farewell. I think the umpires are getting some carry off the Collingwood supporter, but I don't know why I thought they uh, let the game go when the press was really on and it was very difficult to make decisions there and get free kicks. So the final score is a great win and a great game. Hawthorne claimed another flag with a hard-fought win in the 1986 night grand final against Carlton in heavy conditions at VFL Park. The Blues tried valiantly all night, but John Platten's goal in the final quarter sealed the Premiership for the Hawks. He gives it to Platten, a snap shot going pretty close, it'll be a goal! And put down the glasses for the 1986 flag for Hawthorne. 
More than 72,000 fans packed the MCG on August 10 for a game with finals atmosphere between Carlton and Collingwood. Four. 40 metres out. Set sail for goal. Try that one on for goal of the day. Craig Bradley darted around the outer wing to boot the goal of the day. And then came the knockout of the day when Collingwood's Dennis Banks put down David Rees-Jones to win a three-match suspension. It's still David. It's Roy. At least he's wide awake. Well, I don't know about wide awake, but he's awake. Fitzroy went into the final round of the season, knowing they had to defeat the Sydney Swans to make the five. In a low-scoring game, Mick Conlon was the man they turned to. And with goals like this, they were through to the elimination final. Fitzroy have made the finals for 1986. They'll go in fifth position, defeating the Sydney Swans. Great win to Fitzroy. On the same day, Collingwood's Brian Taylor was aiming to become the first player since Peter McKenna to kick 100 goals in a season for the Magpies. It was a shaky beginning for Taylor, but with a free kick and thousands of fans lining the boundary line, he slotted through his 100th. Jim Cracker built a reputation as a fiery customer, as Essendon's Mark Harvey discovered. Still going too, While this bump by Ross Glendinning on Bill Duckworth enraged Bomber fans. But the Kangaroos rubbed salt into Essendon's wounds with Steve McCann's long goal in the final term. Steve McCann straightens up from 70 metres out. It's a magnificent kick. Oh boy, what a kick. And it appeared North coach John Kennedy was particularly keen to let the crowd know just which team had won. And the marks of the year were spectacular as always. It was a miserable day at VFL Park to start the final series as Essendon and Fitzroy fought out a thrilling elimination final. Len Hawker put the Bombers in front after Gary Perth thought he had marked. Oh, it's through. Now they're in front by a point. But once again, the Lions showed their fighting spirit, rushing the ball forward to Mick Conlon, who snatched the game in the last couple of minutes with this goal. Oh yeah, Conlon's got it. He could kick a goal to put him in front. He has. The 1986 Brownlow medal produced a shock result and a tie when Hawthorne's Robert DiPier Domenico and Sydney Swan centre man Greg Williams polled 17 votes each to share the award. For the first time, Hawthorne and Carlton met in a grand final, and either in the air or on the ground, the Hawks' Gary Bacanara was in great touch. Jason Dunstall showed the promise of things to come with goals like this one. But Bacanara was virtually unstoppable, displaying his skills from all distances as Hawthorne went from strength to strength. It's just about there. It has gone through, I think. It's a goal. The Hawks were in full control through Bacanara and Dermot Brereton. And when Dunstall booted his sixth, they had their sixth BFL Premiership safely in their keeping. Out the Dunstall, he's kicked five around Duel. Great tackle by Duel, but Dunstall brushes it aside. This might be the one that they needed. And finally, they break the ice. In the last quarter, six goals to Jason Dunstall.
While Hawthorne and Alan Jean celebrated, the Blues saw their games record holder Bruce Duell make a sad exit after 18 seasons and 359 games. When the first VFL match was played in 1897, who would have thought less than 100 years later, teams would be based in Brisbane and Perth. But the introduction of the Brisbane Bears and the West Coast Eagles was not the only change in 1987. Channel 7 had lost the VFL's television rights to Sydney-based Broadcom. Eventually, the ABC was given the approval to televise games in 1987. The Bears and the Eagles both started on a winning note, but it was another high flyer, Sydney Swans full forward Warwick Kappa, who was winning all the accolades on this day against Richmond. Long kick down to Morwood. Morwood doesn't get the bounce. Great play by Kappa. As he punches it to Morwood, he's got an open goal. Morwood kicks. Kappa ducks back. Oh, he's marked it. What a mark. Kappa's acrobatics were obviously not appreciated by Richmond coach Tony Jewell, who was more concerned about the way his side was playing. Tony Jewell, he doesn't look a very happy man at all. Since they won the 1964 Premiership, Melbourne had spent more than two decades in the doldrums. But under John Northey, they started their resurgence in 1987. The first genuine sign that the Demons meant business came in the 1987 ninth grand final against Essendon when Melbourne scored a thrilling victory, even without injured skipper Robbie Flower. He had to be content to help Danny Hughes hold the trophy aloft. <laughs> Tragedy struck for Carlton early in the season when defender Peter Motley was involved in a serious car accident on his way home from training. The former South Australian eventually won his fight for life but the accident ended a promising football career. There was also a setback for North Melbourne in round 10 when their courageous captain Wayne Schimmelbush went down clutching his knee against the Sydney Swans. After what seemed a harmless fall, Schimmelbush was carried off on a stretcher, a premature end to an outstanding career. And it just looks bad and let's hope it's not, but it's amazing how it happens to champions. It's incredible, that. Hawthorne travelled to Carrara in round 12 and Jason Dunstall showed he could put them through from any angle, soccering the sixth of 11 goals he kicked that day. Gets it off the ground and brings up his sixth goal. Bears forward Jim Edmund earned a hefty six-week penalty in this clash with Hawthorne's Russell Morris, but the Hawks went on to win by 95 points. I think Jimmy Edmund might be reported out of this. Oh, I think he's out to it. The Sydney Swans were all the rage as they hit a three-match winning streak against the Eagles, Essendon and Richmond. The Swans posted scores of 30 goals or more in all three games with football like this. Kappa ducks, weaves on, dropped it at the last moment. Bad luck, Warwick Kappa. Beautiful head pass to Stevie White by Kappa. And it's another one. This is magnificent football. Good play, Kappa. Over to Neagle. Smothered off the boot to Mitchell. Mitchell to Kappa. Kappa goal. At Moorabbin, they were hailing a new goal-kicking hero, young full forward Tony Lockett, who had taken the VFL by storm with his strength and accurate kicking. In round 19 against Footscray, Lockett booted eight goals, including his 100th for the season, the first and killed a player to reach that milestone. Melbourne, led by Robbie Flower, stormed home to the finals and the Demons set the scene for a titanic struggle in round 22 with three teams battling to make the fifth spot. The Demons' victory over Footscray came at a cost. Young star Gary Lyon broke his leg, but Ricky Jackson was not going to let Melbourne's chances slip away. Chance for Jackson! Snapshot for goal is good! Geelong needed to defeat Hawthorne at Cadinia Park to deny the Demons, but Jason Dunstall ran hot late in the game to squeeze the Cats out of the five. And it's there, and it's the Hawks. The Swans made the finals for the second successive year, and Warwick Capper could not stay out of the action. First, he kicked his 100th goal for the season, and then he used Chris Langford's back as a launching pad to take this miraculous mark. The marks of the year. Jason Dunstall. His target. Dunstall! What a great mark! Roger Merritt. Once again. Hi, Merritt! What a great mark! Roger Merritt! 
Kappa for two sensational grabs. Kappa! Oh, what are the marks of the year? Then most of the down in it's going to be Kappa! <laughs> and Dunstall again. On the left foot. Oh! Melbourne's brilliant run continued early in the finals and when the Demons tackled Hawthorne in the preliminary final, the two sides turned on a wonderful display of action and drama. The Demons lost their skipper with a shoulder injury in this bone-jarring collision with Robert DiPia Domenico. But just when the Demons looked as though they had Hawthorne's measure, in came Gary Bacanara to seal one of the most thrilling preliminary finals in the history of the game with a goal after the siren. Bacanara took his shot 15 metres closer after Jim Steins had run across the mark and when the ball sailed through, the Hawks could not contain their delight. What pressure on Gary Bacanara. He is a champion. If he kicks this goal, Hawthorne are in the 1987 Grand Final. If he misses, Melbourne are in. There's the kick. It's a goal. It's a goal. Hawthorne have won with a kick after the siren. What a performance. A magnificent performance this by Hawthorne. Poor old Melbourne. You've got to, the hearts go after the Melbourne Football Club. The Hawks had another win two days later when John Platten shared the Brownlow medal in the second successive Brownlow tie. This time with Tony Lockett, who became the first full forward to win the award. Many experts thought Hawthorne had played their grand final against Melbourne the week before, but they were right. It was a warm day and the Blues were running hot. The hand pass stabs Goldwood, puts it through. That high, the pressure now on the Hawks. The big fist is away. Here's a goal coming up to the Blues. Into the open goal goes Gleeson and it's a goal. He's done all One of their driving forces was Norm Smith medal winner David Rhys-Jones, who completely blanketed Dermot Brereton and set up goals like this for Mark Naley. Oh, Meldrum is down there, knocked away, but again, no ground support. Naley just runs away from three Hawthorne players. He's going goal with Mark Naley. He's put it through. The Blues were relentless as they brushed aside the Hawks, with captain Stephen Kernahan leading by example. Gets into the action. He kicks a goal. Is it another one? Yes, goal. Oh, they're really running hot at the moment. Carlton won the flag, but their season was far from finished. The Blues travelled to the Oval in London to play North Melbourne in a game they called the Battle of Britain. And it was not hard to see why. Londoners were treated to the best and worst of our game as the two sides took a distinct dislike to each other. While the game was listed as an exhibition match, the VFL was alarmed over the violence. And subsequently, seven players were charged and faced the tribunal. Alistair Clarkson and Donald MacDonald of North and Carlton trio David Rhys-Jones, Wayne Johnson and Jim Buckley were all suspended. After a year on the sidelines, the big news to start the 1988 season was the return of Channel 7 to televise football. Football's back on 7, Seven's back in action, and all I can say is we're glad they are. Thank you very much. There were changes too to the night series, which became a pre-season competition. And for the first time since the 1963-day premiership, Hawthorne and Geelong met in a grand final. From 50. Is it there? It is there. Hawthorne hit the front. The Hawks showed all their experience in a thrilling finish and gave new coach Alan Joyce a successful start after he was called in to replace Alan Jeans, who was forced to take a year off football. There were significant changes in Brisbane over summer, but the biggest coup was the signing of high-priced full-forward Warwick Kappa from the Sydney Swans. Oh, what a great shot! Long into the forward line, Williams in best position to mark. It runs free behind, Kappa running into an open goal, great tackle, but he kicks it. Full forwards were in the news back in Melbourne, and St Kilda's Tony Lockett landed himself in trouble in this incident with Fitzroy's Grant Laurie. Under a tougher tribunal system, Lockett was suspended for three weeks. A week later, St Kilda lost Jeff Cunningham for more than half the season after a nasty clash of heads at the SCG. Rod Grinter's crew tackle on Terry Wallace earned him a six-week suspension after being trialled by video. Geelong's Gary Ablett turned on his own show at the MCG on Anzac Day, kicking ten goals against Richmond. But the goal of the year belonged to North Melbourne Ruck Rover Matthew Larkin, who left the West Coast Eagles in a spin under the MCG lights in round six. He snaps it! Oh, oh. He's kicked it! Oh. 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 Play of the night! 
There were plenty of exciting finishes in 1988, and young Geelong rover Robert Scott had all the pressure on his shoulders with this shot against the Sydney Swans after the siren. The siren has sounded, and the youngster knows four premiership points are hanging on this. John Delvine is up out of his seat. Poor kid, poor kid. Let's see what he can do. Tremendous pressure, a difficult angle. The distance not a problem. The it's kick is a beauty. Hit the post. I think it's hit the post. It hit the post. Sydney have won. Sydney have won. At least Scott had a clear shot at goal. Footscray's Simon Beasley found more than the usual quota of men on the mark when he lined up for this kick against the Brisbane Bears in round seven. He comes in now, steadying his approach. He falters. No doubt the crowd getting in his way. And it's going to make it tough. It's going to make it tough for the goal umpire. How could he make a decision? Well, he's got it. Here's the kick. Four premiership points are riding on it. I think he's missed it. One, One point. point. The Bears have done it. Round 11 was at day St Kilda and Tony Lockett won't forget. His season had already suffered one setback with the earlier suspension. But when the burly spearhead went down against Footscray, St Kilda fans feared the worst. Very, very gingerly putting that right foot on the ground. There was more drama to follow when Lockett hobbled into hospital to have his ankle checked. Unaware television news crews were on his trail. After taking a tumble, an obviously distressed Lockett took out his frustration hurling his crutches like toothpicks in a bid to maintain his privacy. When things cooled down, his father Howard provided an explanation. Sorry about that. Uh, hope you all understand, you know, the pressure we've been under and he's not that sort of guy, I can tell you that. Richmond, who had won only two games in the first half of the season, caused the boil over of the year in round 12 when they defeated Carlton at the MCG. Mitchell has gold. Up to the 50 metre mark, out comes Dennis, there's the siren, Richmond have won it. When the final siren sounded, the Tigers jumped for joy, literally, in the case of Peter Wilson. Carlton Stephen Silvani took the mark of the year with this incredible leap in round 14. Oh, what a mark. He was up there for a week. But there were some more great grabs in 1988. Dermot Brereton. Jason Dunstall. Brereton again. Wayne Henwood. Meters. Still in the field of play. Oh, big call! What a mark by Henwood! Jeff Raines. Chip pass intended for Birds. Raines! Paul Bryce. Spargo goes with a high kick. It's going to go deep into the square. Oh. And it's a mark! Dunstall. Andrew Gowers. Quick dolly, Mike. Oh, what a mark! Stephen Stretch. It's two on one, and what a mark! John McCarthy. It was worthy of a final size crowd. Oh, what a mark! A sensational mark by McCarthy. There were few characters to rival Dermot Brereton and Bill Duckworth during the 80s. And in round 18, they decided to get to know each other a little more intimately. Oh, you wouldn't like to meet either of them in a dark night and be unfriendly. And, uh, <laughs> well, there's a bit of humour in football. They look like they're enjoying themselves. <laughs> it was going along just nicely until umpire Ian Clayton thought otherwise and penalised the Hawthorne forward, who seemed less impressed with the decision. Dermot took his chance. Well, that's the siren, and that has cost Jason Dunstall a goal. It was an absolute certainty, and he still needs three for his century. But as usual, Brereton wanted the last word. During the three-quarter time break, took a shortcut, leaving his unique stamp on the game. Hawthorne had not had a century goal kicker since the halcyon days of Peter Hudson. But Jason Dunstall was the Hawks' new goal-kicking machine. He notched his century in round 19 against Fitzroy, and Hawthorne fans applauded the feat in the traditional manner. The West Coast Eagles made the finals in only their second season. Their elimination final encounter against Melbourne was a thriller. Fisted down. Lovell is there. Williams is there. He needs support. Throws it out to line. He shoots. He goes. Melbourne are in front. Gary Lyon put the Demons ahead in the dying minutes. But they had to withstand one last rally by the Eagles. And with 10 seconds remaining, Murray Renstead had the chance to pinch the game. Alas, his shot was offline. The Demons and their fans lived to fight another final. There it is! Victory to Melbourne by two points! Down, 
Sydney Swans ruck rover Jared Healy had proved to be the outstanding player of 1988. While the Swans missed the finals, there was some consolation when Healy won the Brownlow medal. Melbourne went one step better in 1988 when they reached the grand final. But after a lively opening, the Demons succumbed to the pressure applied by Hawthorne. In comes Yates and Steins gets rid of Ayres again. As usual, Dermot Brereton exerted most of the pressure and he showed he could kick them from anywhere. On the pressure. Will he use a check side or a banana kick? Straight. He has. Oh. oh, what a goal! And Jamie Morrissey was rewarded for this fine piece of play. A stretch, a beautiful pick up, but Morrissey took it off him. And Morrissey goes for goal, which he so richly deserves. What a beauty! Paul Abbott booted six goals for the Hawks, who went on to win by a record margin of 96 points. And that is a record margin in a grand final. The only time the Hawks looked like being hemmed in was near the siren. But the coaching staff were soon out to join the celebration and enjoy Hawthorne's seventh premiership. We're out of time in the grand final. in February was again a familiar theme and the 1989 night series saw Hawthorne bow out in unusual circumstances against the West Coast Eagles. The scores were tied at the end of normal time and both sides kept playing until the first score won the game. Anything will do and that's the ball game. Play the siren. But eventually the Eagles bowed out of the series and it was another triumph at night for Melbourne when they defeated Geelong in a close hard-fought final. St Kilda and Carlton were locked in a thrilling battle at Moorabbin in round two. But for the entire game, Tony Lockett had been standing in the way of the Blues who held a two-point margin late in the final term. When he took this mark with less than a minute to go, Lockett had already booted nine of St Kilda's 12 goals, but his 10th clinched the game for the Saints. 43 seconds left on the clock, possibly the last chance for St Kilda. They trail by two points. Tony Lockett. One of the best matches of the decade was the Hawthorne-Geelong clash at Princess Park in round six. And the Cats, with Gary Ablett running hot, bolted to a 49-point lead at half-time. But few sides would have been capable of mounting a comeback like Hawthorne. And the Hawks climbed off the floor to snatch an eight-point victory. The Cats and Ablett fought their way back in the next few weeks. And the Geelong star turned in the best individual performance of the year booting 14 goals against Richmond at the MCG in round nine. A week later, they were back at the MCG against Collingwood. And again, Ablett's sheer brilliance left everyone, commentators included, speechless. Oh, he's a light, Gary Ablett. Look at this. Here is the magician at work. He shoots towards goal. What more can you say? St Kilda fans claimed this was the knockout blow of the year when Tony Locker was booked for striking West Coast Eagles defender Guy McKenna and was suspended for three matches. In fact, it could almost be a booking. The repercussions of Warwick Kappa's last-minute mark and goal were felt by Carlton coach Robert Walls, who found himself dumped in favour of Alex Jesilenko after the Blues lost to the Bears in round 10. Jesselenko was back as the Messiah at Carlton. And almost overnight, the Blues were rejuvenated, winning their first game under their new coach against the Sydney Swans. But the match was marred by several ugly incidents. And this clash between Greg Williams and David Rees-Jones earned the Sydney sentiment a five-week suspension in another trial-by-video case and cost the Carlton defender a broken jaw. David Rees-Jones and holding the jaw. When South Australia came to the MCG on July 1, interstate football had finally returned to Victoria. The reputation of the South Australians as the number one football power was on the line. So too was the reputation of Victoria, but with Jason Dunstall and Tony Lockett part of a formidable Ford lineup, the South Australian defence was powerless as 91,000 fans soaked up Victoria's 86 point win. 4-1 Victoria, South Australia one goal two. 
The Vicks in attack. Log it to Dunster. Oh, he's gone! There was one sour note when Andrew Collins brought down his Hawthorne teammate and South Australian opponent Tony Hall. Unfortunately, Hall buckled under the pressure of the tackle and his season ended with a serious knee injury. And Hall looking in a spot of bother. And he doesn't look too good, he's holding that knee. The Brisbane Bears had a new coach by round 16 when Peter Knights was sacked and replaced by Paul Feltham. After St Kilda made a promising start through Mick Dwyer, the Bears hit back and started Feltham's VFL coaching career with a hard-fought win under the Carrara Lights. With Lockett's season interrupted through injury and suspension, Dunstall charged to the top of the VFL goal-kicking table. The Hawthorne champion and his side breathed a sigh of relief when his 100th sailed through against Carlton in round 18, giving the Hawks a five-point win. There were high stakes when Collingwood and Fitzroy met at VFL Park in round 20, with the winner taking a spot in the elimination final, which probably explained this tangle between Peter Dacos and Scott Clayton. It was a disastrous day for the Lions, who not only lost the game, but key forward Richard Osborne, who went down with a knee injury and was expected to be out of action for at least 12 months. Osborne's still down, the lane has got up. Well, actually, it was an act of frustration by Osborne when he went over to try and get the ball. The High Flyers were in action again in 1989. Nicky Winmar. Mark Bays. Set a half forward for the Eagles. And what a mark. Jason Dunstall. Laffey, but Abbott has played exceptional. Mick Dwyer. He gets it again and kicks it high to full forward. And what a mark by Mick Dwyer. David Honeybun. What a leap by Honeybun. Stephen Stretch. Centre wing. Trevor Barker. Oh, a long high one. Oh, what a mark! Randall hooks it back in front of goal. Here's danger for North Melbourne. Lynch! A brilliant mark over the top. After Collingwood made an early exit, Geelong and Melbourne flexed their muscles in the first semi final. And it was a rugged encounter early in the game. And there's a box on already. Oh, they had to be by Geelong. Well, that was predictable because Geelong are going to be fired up. But the Demons had no answer to that man, Ablett whose marking and goal-kicking prowess took the Cats into the preliminary final. He's a mark. It's a mark, Pete. So after that goal kick by David Cameron down the half on Abbott again, creating opportunities, 25 metres out, 10 metres out, and beats it! Essendon had trouble coping with the strength of Dermot Brereton, who simply demolished the Bombers in the second semi-final. This allows Pritchard to come into an open goal. Darren Pritchard kicks. Is that a goal? After a close first half, the Hawks turned on the power and cruised into their seventh straight grand final. Dunstall. Oh! Pretty to watch. Hawking comes away. Inspired by Gary Ablett, Geelong staged a remarkable turnaround by thrashing Essendon in the preliminary final. A fortnight earlier, Essendon had humbled the Cats, but Ablett's marking, running and goal-kicking left the Bombers bewildered. Ablett was relentless, so magical he occasionally left the commentators bemused, and then inspired as he booted eight and the Cats won by 94 points. Ablett decides to run down towards the 50, goes long, it's bending back, that is a magnificent goal. Stoneham behind the back, Ablett in the pocket, don't tell me. I don't believe it. Towards centre wing, Hocking with great courage, goes back, takes the mark, plays on, shrugs off the tackle from Thompson, beats the hand pass to Bairstow, Bairstow goes down towards half forward, Ablett! That's a party trick, not a mark. <laughs> Geelong maintained its momentum when their popular down-to-earth champion Paul Couch won the Brownlow medal. Couch was the first cat to win the Brownlow since another centreman, Alistair Lord, in 1962. The grand final between Geelong and Hawthorne got off to a sensational start when Yates ran through Brereton. Brereton goes over and bumps him again, but obviously he's done his ribs. Kennedy. Brereton went to the forward pocket to recover and once again provided the catalyst for a Hawk onslaught. The test here. He's taken the mark. Down in the first 15 seconds of the game. A chance to kick Hawthorne's second goal from 25 metres out. He's put it through. 
Darcy to the members' side. Dippy Domenico can't mark. He covers quickly, gets his kick away. The ball runs free at set a half forward. Condon gathers the hand pass. Whitman into Anderson. He goes for goal and pops it through. Taking the time to kick the ball long towards full forward. The marking contest. Hockey can't take it. Curran, snapshot. Looks it across his body. But this would turn out to be one of the great grand finals, as bit by bit, the Cats clawed their way back. Ablett. Gary Ablett was again their hero. Some of his marks and goals were unforgettable. Back to Hornthal. Check side kick. <laughs> Nonchalant. Flanagan now doing the ruck work against Deer. Ablett over the top. Snapshot by Gary Ablett. This is close. Oh, it is mercurial stuff. Gets around Lidner, unloads into the forward line yet again. Kennedy and Bud Ablett over the top. Oh, what a mark. Goes long down towards the pocket. Ablett is there, almost the one-hander. Finds it on the ground. From 25 metres out, he's kicked it. It was a goal. As Geelong closed on the Hawks, Ablett zeroed in on Brereton's grand final record of eight goals. Here goes Ablett for goal number nine, and he's threatened. In a frantic finish, Hawthorne hung on for back-to-back -back premierships. The Hawks are concerned, 